I just love Arizona related species. Welcome everybody to Red's Exotic where I do exotic pet tutorials, guides, and exotic pet feeding. So today I just want to update you guys on my giveaway which is right about there. Unless I get like 2.5k views on my video right up there. So if you want to just like share it right with your friends, it'll be easier for the giveaway so we can you know, do it. Anyways, I just want to do a quick update on my exotic pet collection. Just like a quick vlog, like on my breeding projects, on what's like going on with my collection. So anyways, let's get started with this video. So we're back on, the, on my desk. First up we have is one of my ghost praying mantises. Pretty cute. This is my ghost mantis named Azula. So for people who didn't know, this species of like ghost mantis originated from like Africa. And this species of ghost mantises are like the only species that I know of that can be like kept communally. And they're not very like harmful to like people or anything like that. They're just like really good control for like pests in the garden. So if you want to like keep mantises, you know, they're pretty good for keeping in the garden. And I'm currently going to be like buying or trading like an egg sack of a ghost mantis their egg sacs are called like Utica so I'm gonna be taking like an egg sac from a friend in Facebook and trade like an egg sac for one of my small tarantula slings they molt like upside down and this ghost mantis that I have right now is named Azua and she just recently molted just for like size comparison this is her old molt and this is my ghost mantis so I got my ghost mantis like when she was really really small and then this is like her third instar, her third molt. So we're gonna be attempting to feed her. So usually when you feed ghost mantises, usually like I used to feed them like fruit flies. I'm gonna be like putting up a picture right over there. Usually ghost mantises, like I hand feed them like half dead prey and then they just grab it. But we're gonna attempt to like feed my ghost mantis on a real live food this time and let it hunt for once. So usually they take about like, depending on how big the meal is, like my ghost mantis usually takes like around 30 minutes to finish that. So I'm just probably going to leave it for a bit. And then after that, she cleans herself up after she eats. Oh, she's trying to clean herself up. I got like a couple of seconds. Yeah, see that? Pretty cool. Anyways, um, while we wait for my ghost mantis to finish eating, uh, we're going to be talking about one of my few breeding projects that I really enjoy doing. Um, we got my parthenogenetic uh, species of scorpion, which is my hotentata, hotentata. So this is her like last molt before she is offsprings on her own. So if you guys didn't know, um, parthenogenetic means like this species of scorpion doesn't need like a mate or a pair if that makes sense they can reproduce like asexually just by themselves so currently she's been refusing food and that's like the signs of a of a scorpion mother that's about to like develop embryos inside their womb to like develop like baby scorpions and such so i've fed her like a lot of times and she's been refusing it so i'm gonna assume she's like pregnant and she just molted like a month ago if that makes sense Next up is my Titius stigmaris or my T stigmaris. Um, it's like a Brazilian scorpion. So this one's also parthenogenetic. So I'm like, she's like one molt away from producing her offsprings. And usually I just feed them as much as possible until they molt. But this species of scorpion is really nice because they molt upside down compared to like where scorpions just molt like on the ground this species molts upside down that's why i have like this set of cork bar for her anyways i'm just gonna put her back and leave her be and next up we have are my isopods that i'm trying to like breathe this species of isopods are called dairy cows so for people who didn't know isopods are basically like your cleanup crew and where you would set up in a bioactive enclosures but they're also nice for like viewing pleasure like uh, keeping as like exotic pets so this species of isopods like breed really really fast so as you can see they're like right over there and then as you you can look 
like there's like tiny tiny small dairy cows over there yeah right there they're like really really small so they breed really really fast but this type of species of isopods usually i won't i wouldn't put in like a bioactive enclosure bioactive also means like it's a it's like bioactive means it's like a terrarium that has like a biological effect on it so there's like living plants and then isopods and then eats up all the decaying matter it's pretty good once you uh, you only set it up for like high humidity type of species and tarantulas so they're like all hurl hurdle up in there the reason why the in this enclosure is really small because I'm trying to like breed them as much as possible so the smaller it is the faster they will breed so as you can see I'm doing a great success with this anyways just kind of put that back and then next up is my dwarf white isopods this this is the type of species that you'd put in like a bioactive enclosure because like the compared to like the dairy cow isopods they would sometimes like attack or eat the tarantula while it's molting so i would never advise like putting dairy cow isopods only the dwarf white isopods so dwarf whites are usually like really really small so it's right over there yeah they're really really small so they're really like harmless to like tarantulas so i would advise using them as a cleanup crew compared to um dairy cow isopods so yeah this is my dwarf white isopods this is the only species of isopods that i'd recommend in a bioactive enclosure for your tarantulas and then next one up is my jewel of collections in isopods this is my cubaris sp uh, pak chong sounds stupid honestly but they originated from like thailand so they're really hard to get and they're kind of pricey try and find one right there ah oh, it's so hard to find one oh, there's one it's like really really small this is a small species of cubaris and the species is really hard to breed so i wouldn't advise like getting them unless you like have an idea of how to keep them because they need like a certain type of uh, food and then like humidity requirement and then the heating requirement so they would breed properly I'll just probably do like a picture of it just so you guys can see and then next one up is my assassin bugs their scientific name is called Planimeris sp mambo they're really really cool but they breed like super fast it's unbelievable how they bred so this one's just laying down right there just chilling I guess because this species of assassin bugs they lay eggs like non-stop for people who didn't know this is their eggs like literally they lay like almost a hundred in the past two months and it's super fast and the eggs would usually take like a month to hatch if you do it right usually I like I spray down the, the substrate with like water to keep it moist and high humidity and then right over there if you can see is a hatchling or what we call nymphs in their young stages this nymphs like hatch out on one of these black eggs they push their bodies out and then like in the next eight hours they would like turn into this as you guys know i have over 50 of them that i hatch so they're like all right there in those deli cups it's kind of dark here but those deli cups yep those deli cups in the back those deli cups over there it's everywhere so I'm trying to get rid of them and like sell like tons of them because it's a pain in the ass to like breed them because they produce so much eggs that you don't know what to do with like hundred of them but they're also kind of rare once you like found one it's easy to like breed and then you know trade it or sell it for people so this is what I usually have in one of those deli cups I put substrate sphagnum moss and then a little bit of a small uh, wood drift and then the reason why I put like a wood drift is because they molt upside down so they would never molt unless it's like they're like in a high high area on the ground and I usually feed them like once a week also another thing to consider when you're like keeping one of these species oh whoops like this species or any type of assassin bugs when they eat they have like this small straw in their mouth and then they puncture it in their prey and then they suck out the juices out of their prey with like a venom inside their mouth so anyways this is one of my other breeding projects that i want to showcase this is my female terraphosa sturmy that's always been in the view of my collection she's like one or two molts away from being mature and then once she's like fully matured female i have my male terraphosa sturmy this is my male terraphosa sturmy he's like right inside this hide and it's pretty scary because he's 
freaking huge, but just to showcase on this channel. He is right there, so I won't bother him that much anymore. And the next one up is my female GBB, which is one of my favorite tarantulas. Yeah, so I'm trying to get her like really, really fed because I have like a male, but I'm hoping it does like a sperm web at the moment so I could pair her and the male together and have like an egg sack of them. For people who didn't know, like GBBs, their enclosure should be like really, really dry. So every now and then I just spray it with water just to give her like the humidity she needs and you know, and the hydration she needs. Most of the nutrients she gets are from her dubious, so, or her food, so there's no problem there. So for those who didn't know, this is the tarantula that I'm giving away. It's a GBB, not the adult, but like a slings. So check that link on the upper right, you know, check it out. I'm doing a giveaway. Anyways, here's one of my other uh, GBBs. Um, it's like, I don't know. I think it's a suspected female, so I'm still gonna wait for it on the next month. But here you guys go. Here's a feeding clip right there. Yeah, buddy. Pretty good. So they like to web up the enclosure as always. Pretty amazing. And then this one is the one that I suspect is a male. That I'm sure is a male. Because usually it fuses food, so I'm assuming it already made a sperm web. And it barely does any web. It's just sad enclosure. So I'm hoping this guy is a male. But I'm gonna wait for one more molt and then I can pair this guy and the female that I have over there together. Anyways, thank you guys for watching my quick vlog on the updates of my collection in my exotic pet room. Um, as always, thank you guys for watching. Um, don't forget to watch my giveaway right up there. And also, I won't be doing the giveaway unless I hit like 2,000 to 3,000 views. So just share it to like your friends, you know, share it to your friends so we can get start that giveaway real quick. And on my next video, I'm just like, I'll be teaching you guys on how to make a bioactive enclosure. I already picked up the equipment and resources that I need to set up the bioactive enclosure. Also, huge shout out to Lester Javier. He made me this awesome banner picture right here. So just a huge shout out to him. Mm. Oh, and by the way, this is just green tea, just so you guys know. Anyways, so cheers.